Hello everyone, welcome to the 225 Literary and Jury Charge. We're going to start out with some Latin and French words. I'm going to give you the words and then read you the paragraph. Here we go. We've got inter vivos, quid pro quo, vor dire, or vor dire, you hear it both ways, uh, curriculum vitae. All right, here is your paragraph and I will read this at 180. A transaction between living persons is referred to as inter vivos, and inter vivos trust is a legal document creating rights among individuals prior to the death of any one of them, and inter vivos trust differs from a testamentary trust. Quid pro quo means what for what or something for something. An early form of the concept of a consideration in a contract is referred to as quid pro quo. The French term vordir means to speak the truth. A vordir examination of a juror is conducted to determine a person's qualifications to serve on a jury. Curriculum vitae literally means the course of one's life. Frequently shortened to CV, a curriculum vitae is a written account of one's personal history in a resume format. All right. I have some congressional record. The subject is men's only clubs. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you a word list before we get started. You're going to hear counterparts, Paul Lang Tyler, posture, conjunction, discrimination, justification, community, senator, economic, exclusive, wholeheartedly, Mr. Gable, ridiculous, Iowa, and uh, let's see, Mr. President. All right, I will read this at, I'll go ahead and read this at 200. Here we go, ready? Mr. Gable, Mr. President, I thank the senator from Iowa. I wholeheartedly agree on his last point. One of the greatest losses to the United States is that women have not been active enough in our economy. Business Week magazine recently conducted a study out of a total of 5,000 top paid individuals in big business in this country were women. Of those 22 women, 15 were in positions of responsibility because they were the wife or daughter of the chairman of the board. Doesn't it appear that women have never been given a chance? Until just recently, some of the best Eastern schools were classified as men-only colleges. This is ridiculous. Were they implying that women are less intelligent than their male counterparts? We should only encourage women to seek an equal chance. We should enable them to get an equal chance. Women are beginning to get into the top law schools and top medical schools, but it is a slow process. We as members of Congress should certainly do our best to discourage exclusive memberships in clubs for men only. If women are excluded, this is a form of social and economic discrimination. The problem we are faced with is evaluating the position of Paul Lang Taylor, who has adapted a posture of defense for the rights to all male social clubs, which exclude women. I wonder if Mr. Taylor understands the discrimination that is involved in the issue. A social club is organized to conduct business, social, and community activities. If women are excluded, Mr. Taylor is inferring that they have no business conducting these activities in conjunction with their male counterparts. I do not agree with Mr. Taylor's point of view, and I would like him to present to this committee in writing a justification of his position. All right. I have some expert testimony. And you are going to hear Realty, California, Real Estate, Glen Cannon, or Glen Canyon, American Institute, Colorado, Broker, Leasing, Exception, Vietnam, Aspect, Brokerage, Acquisition, Los Angeles, Appraisers, Appraisal, and Centurion. All right, so I will read this at 180. Here we go. I entered the field of real estate in 1985 as a real estate salesman for a company which was later to become Centurion, C-E-N-T-U-R-I-O-N, Realty Company, and I was engaged in the selling, leasing, and the rental 
of real property and in some property management business until 1995, at which time I took the examination and became a real estate broker and a business opportunity broker. I continued in the real estate field full time until 1998 when I undertook the appraisal of real property and I attended the University of Southern California. I took special courses sponsored by the American Institute of Real Estate Appraisers called Real Estate Case Study Course Number 101, which was put on at USC in 1998. In 1999, I went to the University of Colorado and took case study courses number 102. Unfortunately, I failed the examination in Colorado. There were, there were out of a class of 55 that passed the examination, so the examination was offered again, and I did not take the re-examination, but I attended the course at USC in 2000 and retook case study course number 102 and successfully passed the examinations. And at that time, I assisted in the field work and training aspect of the course. From 1998 until the present time, the majority of my time has been devoted to real estate and to the appraisal of real property. I have become the president of Centurion Real Estate Company and do conduct a general real estate business under the last name at that same address, 1250 Glen Cannon Avenue in Los Angeles. And in 2005, I formed a corporation for the appraisal business, appraisal and right-of-way acquisition business called the Southern California Appraisers Incorporated, and I'm president of that cor corporation also. It is located at the same address in Los Angeles. I have been employed full-time in the appraisal and brokerage of real estate since 1985, with the exception of during the war. I spent three years at a Midwestern defense plant, but I maintained my interest and kept up my activities in the real estate field at the same time. All right. I'm going to read to you about the new... Alfa Romeo. It's a sedan. Here we go. Ready? Alfa Romeo has a 107 year history but is virtually unknown to U.S. motorists of millennial age or younger. The Italian automaker retreated from the American market in 1995. In 2015, Alfa tested the waters here with its high strung 4C Spider and Coupe sports cars. Now it joins in with the sedan. Developed from scratch, the car borrows nothing from Fiat or Chrysler vehicles, which is uh, Fiat and Chrysler Automobiles is Alpha's parent company. Except for Alpha's traditional triangular grille, the sedan styling resembles the BMW's iconic 3 Series. The interior is distinctive with an especially well-integrated infotainment screen and a Formula One inspired ignition push button mounted on the steering wheel. Controls are generally less fussy than those of German cars, though the cabin's fit and finish aren't quite up to Teutonic standards. The back seat and trunk size are par for the course as compact sedans go. It's a perfect fit when it comes to the mechanicals. A 280 horsepower turbo four makes the car pretty plenty quick with a zero to 60 mile per hour time of about five seconds. A bi-turbo V6 derived from a Ferrari V8, which produces a monstrous 505 horsepower is also available. As for driving dynamics, the saucy sedan can rip through curves with abandon, yet it remains relaxed and comfy on the highway. The super hot all wheel drive V6 quad edition is pricey at around $74,000 though hardcore driving enthusiasts will find it worth the money. Fortunately, the rear-wheel drive four-cylinder sedan starts at a more accessible $38,990 and comes nicely equipped with such standard features as leather upholstery, upgraded headlights, power front seats, and parking sensors. All right. I've got an article here doing okay on time all right this is on public utilities here we go ready mr. president I am introducing at this time a bill on behalf of myself and my colleagues Joseph Medina and Alfred Valentine 
to provide for the more consistent and equitable treatment of property owned by the public utilities. This bill also provides for the omission of a back tax liability assessed on public utilities. Congress provided the public utilities with an investment tax credit and an accelerated depreciation allowance. These tax incentives were established in order to encourage capital formation by the utilities. Congress intended that the benefits that were derived from these tax incentives be used for plant and equipment modernization rather than passing the benefits directly to the consumers. In sharp contrast, the original intent of Congress, several state public utility commissions offered the utility companies to pass this tax benefit directly to the consumers in the form of rate reductions. Additionally, the Internal Revenue Service ruled that the utilities be denied access to the investment credit and also to the accelerated depreciation. Several of the state public utilities have purchased this matter all the way to their own state Supreme Courts, but in all instances, the ruling has been against the public utilities. I believe it is important that Congress make clear its intent on this matter. My bill will clarify the Internal Revenue Code with respect to accelerated depreciation and exempt the public utilities from a back tax liability. Last year in Congress, legislation which is identical to this bill was passed in the House of Representatives. There was not one dissenting vote. This legislation will clearly correct all of the inequities. If there is no objection, I will urge my colleagues to respond and quickly evaluate the measure. All right, and that, let's see here. We're doing okay, good. All right, I've got some jury charge. The subject here is assault and battery. Here we go, ready? I will read this at 200. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, an assault and battery may be defined as any unlawful use of force or violence on the person of another or the wrongful violence or constraint inflicted on a human being without his consent. The intent to injure is not an essential element of assault and battery. If the act causing an injury is unlawful, the deliberate hitting or striking of a person is unlawful and the person is doing an unlawful act unless made in self-defense. If the injury caused is wrongful, then the intent must necessarily be wrongful. Every person is presumed to intend the consequences which follow the commission of an unlawful act. The burden of proof in this case rests upon the plaintiff to prove by the greater weight of the evidence that the defendant committed an assault and battery upon the plaintiff by hitting him in the face or on the head. And if you find that the defendant did so hit the plaintiff, then the plaintiff is entitled to recover from the defendant the damages which he has actually sustained by reason of such assault and battery. The defendant claims that the plaintiff assaulted the defendant and used or used abusive and insulting language which provoked the acts on the part of the defendant. It is the law in the state that mere words or acts not amounting to such assault, however gross and abusive or insulting such language is, and even those spoken or performed for the purpose of provoking an assault, are no defense to a civil action for assault and battery. If you find from the evidence in this case that the plaintiff is entitled to recover damages from the defendant, there is one other element of damages in a case of this kind which you have a right to consider. It is claimed by the plaintiff that this assault was willfully and maliciously made. If you find from the evidence that the assault was in fact willfully and maliciously made, then you may find a further sum of damages in favor of the plaintiff, which the law calls exemplary or punitive damages. The jury is not required to find exemplary or punitive damages in any case, but they may in their discretion do so if they find that the assault was maliciously made. An injury is regarded as malicious when it is done with malice in the mind of the person who does it with ill will and wrongful feelings toward that person. That is an intent or purpose to do that person an injury. By exemplary damages is meant damages which are intended to serve as an example to others and to deter and prevent others from committing similar acts. Such damages are also called punitive damages because they serve as a punishment to the party who committed the assault and battery. As stated before, the burden of proof rests upon the plaintiff to prove by the greater weight of the evidence that the defendant did wrongfully assault and beat the plaintiff, as claimed by the plaintiff. 
if you find from the evidence by the greater weight thereof that the defendant did so assault and strike the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in favor of the plaintiff for such amount as will fully and fairly compensate him for the injuries directly flowing from the alleged assault and for all damages proximately caused by defendant's wrongful acts, that is, all consequences of the injury, future, as well as past, including mental suffering, indignity, disgrace, and mortification arising out of said assault, and including also pain and suffering, all expenses incurred, such as doctor bills, hospital bills, diminished capacity for work and loss of time from work, and all other damages which are the direct proximate cause of such wrongful assault. To the actual damages so found, you have the right to add such exemplary or punitive damages as you may deem just and reasonable. If you find that the plaintiff did use abusive and proactive language toward the defendant, then you have the right to consider that in mitigation of exemplary damages, but such abusive language by the plaintiff does not permit you to reduce the damages actually sustained by the plaintiff. All right, what are you doing on time? All right. I have an article here. This is called Greater Expectations and Chasing Rabbits beyond the comfort zone and this is from the journal for the reporting and captioning professions magazine okay all right here we go replies continue to arrive and percolate from my column titled great expectations each day I listen, process, and filter information from students and court reporters regarding court reporting and tutoring. Much current discussion concerns how others view our work. We are experiencing changes in expectations, shifts from large companies working with captioners and cart providers and electronic recording companies working in courthouses and other locations. And we have shifts in contracting. Each shift affects all areas as I see it. Recently, I returned a call from a student. She has been in school for more than four years. With much emotion, or my phrase, passion, she shared her world. I asked her a few questions, including whether she spent time reading back her notes. She replied, I do not like to read my notes or to see my errors. I do not like to focus on my errors. I have to move forward. I howled with laughter. When I could speak, I softly said, you might see yourself profiled in my next column. She paused for only a moment before assertively replying, that's fine, so are you going to tell me how to do this or not? Laughter exploded in real time from my mouth. When we ended the call, a very different conversation had evolved. We had what I call an accountable dialogue. I wished her all the best in her court reporting studies, and I did not think I would hear back from her. But the next morning, I received an email. I'm ready to begin, let's get started, she said. I realize that although I've been in school a long time, I have much to learn. I want to be a success in this field and will do whatever you suggest to make that happen. What am I mainly looking for? I replied, accuracy. She sent a lengthy email ending, what am I looking for when grading my tests? I replied, no errors. Her motivation is now graduation and employment. She is a successful and wise person. I hear it and see it in her emails. When we last spoke, she casually shared, almost as an afterthought, that she has a bachelor degree. In Texas, we might say, that dog can hunt. That same day, I spoke with an official real-time court reporter who has worked for more than 25 years with technical daily events within her courtroom. She purchased every book out there and attended every seminar possible. After attending a seminar that changed her entire theory, she is currently unable to write real-time. Her quest is now how to undo all I've changed so I can return to real time in court again. Her motivation is fear of ER in our area. I have great respect for each of these two women's stories as well as their reaching out. Reaching out takes courage. While I work with the student and the official, we focused on details and move forward with new goals, new visions to ensure that they, are, that they arrive at where they truly want to be. I see, I see similarities between the student and the official. Each one is sharing facts that I have heard multiple times. Each one feels bad about where they are now. 
when I shared with them that I might write this article because it continues to nudge me as a cart provider, court reporter, instructor, and tutor, each one stated that she felt bad for the other, the student for the official and the official for the student. And each said, if this helps others, sure, go for it. So I am. From my seat, I see a student who does not want to look back to see her errors and to experience successful court reporter or an experienced successful court reporter who is reaching out everywhere to perfect her writing. I opined with the reporter. She's like an eager individual in an ice cream factory with too many choices because she has each book, works with each book, and then moves to a different book. The reporter replied, too many flavors. I don't have that problem with shoes or clothes. I may train with a broken switch. I'm frozen. I know once you put me on the right track moving forward, I'll be like the little engine that could. I think I can, I know I can, even if uphill. We selected a book of her choice, moved her away from the entire new theory while working on the job. We also created a custom dictionary so she can real time at work and in her court again. This lady is a success. With years on the job as an official, her goal to perfect her skills makes her a success. And yes, she is nationally certified. I believe that dog can hunt. How does this relate to greater expectations? The student who desires good notes or notes just to pass that test now admits that she has far from perfect notes, and yet she wants and needs to forge ahead. The official, in an attempt to write perfect notes, began darting in multiple directions before she settled down to learn a new theory. Can one learn a new theory in court full-time each day after having a dictionary completely changed to, act to achieve that goal? All reporters understand that transcripts must be produced even while advancing their skills for the future. Can a student move forward without transcribing accurately? All reporters, students, and instructors understand when students say, I have to get out of school. While writing this article, I took a call in my office. The caller defined herself as a former educator. She asked me questions about court reporter training and stayed on task. And if students needed to be hooked at the hip to that machine 24-7, she added, at the school, I think they are chasing a lot of rabbits. I thought about the student with more than four years of writing and not wanting to correct errors. I also thought about the official with more than 25 years experience darting through multiple books and a new theory. And I saw a tie in for the student and the court reporter and many of us. Are we chasing a lot of rabbits to achieve our goals? Are we focused on specifics with realistic deadlines? Or are we fearful of changes, shifts that have come? Or will there be or will be here if we don't achieve that goal? I listed to the former educator and gently replied. This skill is unlike any other. It requires mastering to be successful. Individuals entering this profession and this schooling with the knowledge that the pass rate is 95% or above in court reporting for each speed class must know the schooling and the occupation, have a bar of excellence, very different from many other professions. Then I shared this topic with the sign interpreter after she expressed stress and frustration within the interpreting world. The interpreter encouraged me to stay away from stress while working. I emailed back and said, from your lips to God's ears. What about the tie-in and you? Could someone say that court reporting and or the student can hunt? Are you chasing rabbits with greater expectations? I see a surefire path that this shift topic and the expectations are percolating with students, instructors, and court reporters. We have great passions and great skills. Communication is a powerful tool, and I am honored to be among you. All right, and that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 225 class.